Welcome to the ministry of Lifetime.org, where we have been presenting God's message of freedom and grace in Christ for well over 30 years. Our Heavenly Father is passionately interested in us, in our hearts, our lives, and in the concerns that weigh us down, such as depression and its accompanying torments. Exiting from the dark despondency of depression does not occur by applying a quick fix, but neither is it a hopeless problem. Far from it. The steady healing hand of God is an incredible remedy for most causes of depression. In this audio version of their book, Conquering Depression, Bill and Annabelle Gillum provide insight, guidance, hope, and practical counsel for vanquishing depression from your life. For additional resources or contact information, visit Lifetime.org. Now as we begin, Heavenly Father, we are trusting you while we read. Would you open the windows of your hope and light to us and show us the way up through and out of depression? In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Conquering Depression by Dr. Bill and Annabelle Gillum Chapter 1 Chances are you know someone who has struggled with depression. Many of you likely know someone, or at least of someone, who was so depressed that they actually took their own life. Maybe the person you know is depressed right now, even as you read this sentence. It is someone you care about, and you want so much to help, but nothing you do or say seems to make any difference. Maybe you are the one who is depressed, looking desperately for a way out. Nearly everyone experiences some degree of depression at some point in his or her life. Very few people could say they have never awakened blue or gone throughout the day feeling down and unhappy, sometimes without explanation. For some, this is for a day or two or every so often. For some, it is a nagging frustration, but for many others, it is a way of living. Depression typically carries with it a stigma in our society, as though it were a mark of disgrace or weakness of character, an indication that a person is unable to step up to life's challenges. For the Christian, it is often considered a sign that he or she is not living the Christian life and is therefore unhappy. What many fail to see, though, is that even great men and women of faith suffered bouts of depression. Revisit the biblical accounts of Job, King David, Naomi, Jonah, Paul, and Timothy to name just a few. And consider Elijah. Queen Jezebel was Elijah's arch enemy, and she held a deep and abiding hatred for him. One day she sent a messenger to find Elijah and tell him that by tomorrow about this time he would be hunted down and put to death by the sword. Scriptures tell us that after hearing this, Elijah went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take my life, for I am not better than my father's. Sitting under the sparse shade of that tree, what sort of thoughts do you suppose Elijah was experiencing? Everything is hopeless. Nothing to be done now. I have failed, and no better than my father was. I want to die. Elijah, the great prophet of God whose prayers brought life back to a dead child, was so low that he wanted to die. The great hero of the faith who prayed down fires from heaven that consumed Baal's priests and their altars of stone? Yes, the same man, withdrawal, gloom, dejection, and a level of despair that longs for death. It would be no stretch to say that Elijah was depressed. How long has it been since you read the Psalms? Many times, on the run from King Saul, hiding in caves, sick with grief over the loss of his dear friend, David found himself in the grip of despair. Save me, O God. I have sunk in deep mire, and there is no foothold. So often his psalms read like journal entries, confused, desperate. Why are you in despair, O my soul, and why have you become disturbed within me? Despair, the complete loss of hope. When depression overwhelms a person, it raises a black flag of hopelessness above them. Why hope? And for what? Something good to happen? Right. Such despair is very near the rock-bottom low of depression, and King David called out from that place. And what about Paul, penman of the bulk of the New Testament? In his second letter to the new Christians at Corinth, he recounted his trip to Asia with Timothy, writing about how they were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despaired even of life. Both Paul and Timothy reached a level of such despair that they did not care to go on living. 
Have you ever been so low that you despaired even of life? Are you that low right now? What is depression? The Mosby Medical Encyclopedia defines depression as an emotional state in which there are extreme feelings of sadness, dejection, lack of worth, and emptiness. The leading psychiatric manual measures its severity on a scale ranging from mild to severe with psychotic features. Its warning signs include sleep disturbances, lack of interest or pleasure in usual activities, losing or gaining weight, feelings of sadness, feeling tired all the time, feelings of guilt or worthlessness, problems concentrating, suicidal thoughts. Such symptoms, piled one on top of the other, can enormously tax a person's will and emotions. Even so, it's not uncommon for friends, family members, and the family doctor to fail to realize they themselves are depressed. They are so accustomed to living with depression that it's what they call normal. To their way of thinking, it's just the way they are. This is just me, they think. Everyone gets discouraged. Everyone has experienced the Monday morning syndrome. But there is a great difference between sadness, which is a perfectly normal and healthy aspect of being human, and debilitating depression, which is not perfectly normal and healthy. Sadness is expected when someone you love passes away, but months and months of obsessive ruminations and tears are not normal or healthy. Feeling down does not rule out hope. Depression does. The blues do not render a person seemingly helpless. Depression does. Discouragement can be part of anyone's day or week, but depression lays waste not just to weeks, but to months and years at a time, and sometimes to life itself. Are there different kinds of depression? There are cases in which an organic or physiological problem can be the direct cause of a person's depression. Physical illness, hormone imbalances, nervous disorders, diabetes, hypothyroidism, stroke, even infection can be the prime cause of an individual's depression. We don't profess to be experts regarding such causes as these, but common sense tells us that such physical problems must be treated before, during, and after Christian counseling is utilized. Our Father is a healing God, all-powerful and quite capable of healing any affliction. But it's unreasonable to trust for and expect victory over depression while at the same time refusing to treat for a hormone imbalance, for example. For many years, psychology, as a discipline and a practice, has focused not just on these physical causes of and treatments for depression, but on the mental ones as well. Because of all this, there is a great deal of data available regarding how people act out their depression, how they tend to think about themselves, the potential severity of depression syndrome, what to watch for in someone who's seriously depressed, and much more. It should come as no surprise, though, that such information is sorely lacking when it comes to providing meaningful insight into the spiritual causes of depression. Mention is virtually non-existent regarding Jesus and his resources within the Christian and spiritual solutions, particularly as to the real victory found in the indwelling Christ expressing his life through believers and the believer's true identity in Christ. These are typically dismissed altogether. We who have received Jesus as our Savior know firsthand what his presence can do. He changes lives, and no one needs to tell us that everyone needs to know Jesus. Coming to Him first and then seeking an understanding of Him and His ways is the cornerstone of any true victorious life. God said, Let him who boasts boast about this, that he understands and knows me. God, in His grace, has given the two of us wonderful insight into not only the spiritual causes of depression, but the liberating spiritual solutions as well. These much-neglected aspects are what we intend to focus on in this brief book, offering not just hope to those who suffer from depression, but providing guidance toward real, biblical, and practical steps up and out of the basement of despair. Are medications useful in treating depression? It's hard to imagine someone really being able to appropriate spiritual steps toward victory over depression if his blood sugar level is off the charts, or if her cycle initiates bizarre shifts in her hormone levels, causing her to spiral into depression and stay there. Such people require medication whether they're struggling with depression or not. 
Medicinal treatment in such cases is imperative. It serves to neutralize a person's physical deficiency and in the process reduce their depression. But what about antidepressants, medications specifically used to help prevent or relieve depression? The drug manufacturer Eli Lilly introduced the world to Prozac in 1987. Ten years later, the small green and white capsule was being used by over 27 million people worldwide to combat depression. Today, antidepressants are the second largest class of prescription drugs, and their sales are surpassed only by heart medications. Clearly, antidepressants are effective on some level for many people. In fact, some studies indicate that 35 to 45 percent of those who take them experience complete relief from their symptoms. But millions more, 55 to 65 percent, are not helped nearly enough. Many are unable to even use the drugs because of their side effects, and most patients who receive only medication for severe depression will experience a return of their symptoms within a year after stopping treatment. Depression is a very complex problem, and while increasing knowledge often leads to breakthroughs, antidepressants are a far cry from a cure-all. As we have already said, we are not medical doctors. This book does not address the subtle differences between various antidepressants, the latest developments in genetic research, or fluctuations of serotonin levels in the brain. Our goal in this book is to bring to light the woefully neglected and yet wonderfully effective spiritual solutions to depression. We do know about healing. We have seen it occur many, many times in the lives of those who understand just what it means to share a relationship with Christ. Please read this next sentence carefully. We believe with all our hearts that victory in this life, whether it's over depression, greed, or a foul mouth, is available and by our Father's grace, already ours to appropriate. That's right. His victory over depression is your victory over depression, already. The Spiritual Causes of Depression When Paul blessed the Thessalonians in his first letter to them, he prayed for the God of peace to purify them entirely, spirit and soul and body. Your parts, the parts that make you up entirely, are in one package. You aren't strictly one or the other all physical or only mental or just spiritual. What this means is that whatever affects one part of you affects the other parts of you as well. Pull the muscles in your back, and the rest of you will be in bed all day too, right along with your back. As we pointed out earlier, there are cases of depression that can be traced straight to physical causes. But after years of counseling and listening to countless testimonies, we have come to see that a great number of Christians suffer from depression due to a spiritual cause. Depression that results directly from misunderstanding how to relate to Jesus Christ and rest in His finished work for us. Or put another way, depression due to walking in deception. Please don't mistake us. We aren't suggesting that if you wrestle with chronic depression that you're backslidden. You may have prayed many times on your knees to our Father for help with depression, desperate for answers. And you certainly don't need more faith. The same faith you use to get saved is all the faith you need in your relationship with Him. That is, faith the size of a mustard seed. What we are saying is that misunderstanding your Heavenly Father and His relationship with you can lead to many dread ends, one of which is the dead end of depression. With absolute conviction, we believe the Scriptures clearly reveal that the Christian life is intended to be lived victoriously by all those who believe in and rely upon the saving grace and strength of Jesus, and that this in no way excludes those believers whose lives are mired in depression. We do not teach a Christian life untroubled by tragedy, illness, sadness, or hard times. Far from it, actually. In the world you have tribulation, Jesus said. Praise God, he went on to say, but take courage. I have overcome the world. A surefire recipe for living in depression. Write this down and put it someplace where you'll see it regularly. Jesus was the only one who ever lived the Christian life. Go back and read that again before we go on. Jesus was the only one who ever lived the Christian life. Does this mean your own attempts at living the Christian life are pointless and futile? 
Exactly. Like building your house on sand. Nothing you do under your own steam, no matter how effective or holy, can measure up. Kind of scary, isn't it? Read on. This is only half of the equation. Jesus said he came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. If you look up the word abundant in your dictionary, you'll find that it means more than enough. More than enough. He came to earth so that you as a Christian might have not just life, but more than enough life. Look at what Paul wrote in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The Spirit gives life, he wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, and he refers to Christ who is our life in his letter to the Colossians. His power, his victory, his peace and love, his life, all inside the one who believes in Christ Jesus, all inside you. This is what Paul was getting at when he encouraged the Colossians to remember Christ in you, the hope of glory. Take a minute to let that sink in. Now remember these words. If you do not understand how to trust Him in and through you to face life on this planet, claiming and appropriating His victory over this world, then you are a moving, breathing recipe for potential depression. Deceive. To cause to believe an untruth. We must become very clear about something before we go any farther. The Bible says that Satan is real and that whatever he can do to keep you from trusting God and in his strength, he will do it. He is not above any scheme. No blow is too low, and depression is one of his most daring and reliable strategies. He knows the truths in this book are key not just to victory over depression, but to the Christian life. Don't be fooled. He is not the skinny, grinning little man in red underwear, but he is the great dragon who was thrown down, the serpent of old who is called Satan, who deceives the whole world. He is a liar and the father of lies, Jesus said, and he's bent by any means on deceiving you. The secret of his success? If he can trick you into believing something which is true, which in reality is false, then he has you deceived. On the other hand, if he can trick you into believing something is false, which in reality is liberating truth from God, then he also has you deceived. Our Father's IQ is incalculable. For who has known the mind of the Lord, Paul asks in his letter to the Christians in Rome? While nothing compared to God's, Satan's IQ must be high as well. After Satan's fall from grace, God spoke to him in the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, reminding the fallen angel, You had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Prior to his fall, Lucifer occupied a special place of prominence in heaven, guarding the very throne of God. So he must have been, and must still be, very wise indeed. Let's give him an IQ of around 20,000. You can see that while Satan may be no intellectual match for God, he can sure outsmart us humans. That's a pretty daunting proposition, isn't it? Even our brightest minds are still vastly surpassed by the deceiver's intelligence. He can tie us in knots. He can deceive us so quickly we won't know what hit us. But guess what? We don't have to engage in an intellectual battle with him, or any kind of battle. He's already been defeated. Past tense. He was defeated by God long ago, and he's lost all power and all authority. He was, still is, and will always be the loser. So he uses the only thing a user can use to make it seem as though he's a winner. Deception. He dearly loves to see a Christian walking in deception. Tapping into the life of Christ within you and appropriating his victory over the deceiver and his lies is no new self-help idea. It doesn't take the IQ of Albert Einstein to understand it, and it's no secret. It's the gospel. As old as the New Testament, Christ in you. That's the Son of the living God inside you. He is the hope of glory. And this is the hope that does not disappoint. 
How we long for you to grasp the simplicity of experiencing his victory in this world, not just over depression, but in every area of your life. His desire is for relationship with you. He loves you as his child, not as some cold authoritarian who's bent on ruling you. He is not in the business of forcing himself on anyone. His strength in this life, his success at being a parent, his power in facing the day, his integrity in the workplace, his victory over depression, all of this is yours for the choosing. Back to basics, the model of man. When you really want to learn about something, it's best to get back to the basics. If you want to learn to fly an airplane, then it only makes sense to learn about the basics of flying, wind speed and direction, how a plane becomes airborne and stays that way, what an altimeter is, and so on. In the same way, if you want to understand how you tend to think and behave, how depression can take root, and how to appropriate and practice God's victory over the deceiver and depression, you need to understand the basics of what it means to be human. God designed you with a spirit, soul, and body. The spirit is relatively easy to define. It's that part of you that, prior to your being born again, was dead in your trespasses and sins. Of course, it's that same part of you that was given new life, born again, when you chose to confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believed in your heart that God raised him from the dead. When you were born physically, you were given the capacity to interact with the world around you. When you were born again, that is spiritually born, you were given the capacity to interact with your father. The soul is a little more difficult to grasp. Few people today seem to have thought much about it. Ask someone what her soul is and she's likely to say, a puff of smoke or something. In fact, your soul is what makes you, you. Said another way, it's that part of you that makes up your mind, will, and emotions, your thinker, chooser, and feeler. It is your soul, mind, will, and emotions that interacts with your Heavenly Father through your new, reborn spirit. Your body, on the other hand, is the vehicle here on earth through which your soul interacts with other people. 2 Corinthians 5.1 refers to the body as an earthly tent. I believe it was author C.S. Lovett who called it an earth suit. As I type this sentence, my soul is telling the muscles in my earth suit to make its fingers hit certain keys on my computer keyboard, and my earth suit is doing its best to obey. You are presently telling your earth suit to make its eyes move across these rows of print, and as a result, we are communicating with each other's souls. The Greatest Need You might not have mapped out just what it means to be human before now, but you've probably already found out in life that God designed you with some basic human needs. Your body needs food and water and rest, for example, or special attention when it's sick. We are all born with a dead spirit, and so from the start, your spirit desperately needs to become alive so that you can know Jesus. After coming to Him, your spirit needs regular interaction with Him in order to mature and grow. The soul has its needs as well. In your mind, you need peace, among other things. Your emotions thrive on a sense of well-being, and your will needs nothing less than freedom to choose. These are all basic needs common to everyone, but the greatest need of all is the need to be loved. When Jesus commanded you to love your neighbor as yourself, he knew that to be able to love your neighbor, you had to first be able to love yourself. In order to give something to someone, we must have it to give, right? But there is still a more profound reason why our Father created us with this need for love. It's simple, really. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Not only does John say that love is from God, he goes on to say that without it, you don't really know God, because God is love. We need love, in other words, because God is love. And if we had no need for love, we would have no need for God. This is, of course, all by your Creator's design. He made you this way to have an intense and basic need to be loved by the one who created you, God himself. As you will see, he also designed it such that he alone can serve as your ultimate source of love and that only by tapping into him as your source can you most effectively love him in return, love others, 
receive love, and love and accept yourself. Realize this alone will bring you a step out of the basement of despair. Depression, symptom or cause? If you came into our office seeking counseling for depression, one of the first things we would look for is hostility. Hostility is a telltale sign that you're not getting your need for love met, either from a source outside you, such as God and others, or from yourself. And more often than not, it's not one or the other, but both. This works like a domino effect. For those who live without love, the deprivation leads to the domino of frustration. They can't get the need met, and as their frustration increases, it in turn leads to the domino of hostility. With the increase of these two things, it's only a matter of time before the domino of depression falls hard. Starving for love and unable to get it, these people get tunnel vision, and their search for love becomes their all-consuming pursuit. In such desperation, life without love often leads to decisions and behavior that they never imagined themselves capable of carrying out. I will find someone to love me, she thinks, and the next thing she knows, she's involved with someone other than her spouse. Or, I just can't deal with these feelings, he decides, and he ends up hooked on drugs to anesthetize his mind. Or, I choose not to live without love and the ultimate decision is made to commit suicide. It goes without saying that mankind continues today a long history of going everywhere but to the true source to try and satisfy this inherent need for love. Our Heavenly Father forces no one to love Him. Remember the old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink? Real love, the deepest and most meaningful love, is exercised solely by choice, You get to choose whether or not you will drink from his source. This, too, is by his design. But so many freely choose to reject his love, or are ignorant of it, or decide they themselves are the best candidate to satisfy their needs their way. Or they declare that they don't even need love, which can't possibly be true, because we were created to need him. So they live without love. As counselors, we've listened to and interacted with many people over many years. The hurting person typically talks to us about what counselors refer to as the presenting problem or what they think their problem is. In an overwhelming number of cases, we see that what they're actually calling their problem, that is depression, is in reality simply a symptom of their problem. They are typically looking for a way to eliminate a symptom, which in their view would solve their problem. But this won't work. You can't eliminate a symptom and expect the cause to go away. Like a fever to infection, depression is to an unmet need for love. Think of how absurd it would be to treat your child's fever, a symptom of infection, by packing her in ice. It may help the fever, but it won't treat the infection. Likewise, treating depression may help the symptoms, but it won't treat the unmet need to be loved and respect oneself. That is the underlying cause. Defining God. Many people have tried to define God. He is impossible to put into a tidy box of definition. But there are some things we know. God is love, as we've already seen. And this, God runs things and nothing works when we try to sit in his chair. Creators have rights and our creator God is no exception. He could have created us with a tail if he wanted to. But out of love, beyond our wildest imaginings, and with his deep desire for relationship with us, he designed us to work best when in a relationship with him. As the creator, he had this right. But remember that his motivation was and always is out of agape love. That is, I will do the most constructive, redemptive thing for you. Painful as it must be for him, if we choose to live independently of him, trusting in ourselves and our own resources in this life, he allows us to run headlong down the pathways of our own blazing and into the brick walls of our own making. He will not force us to love him. But why not create us with all our needs already met? makes perfect sense to ask. Many Christians are taught not to ask such questions or to search out such thorny issues, that if they do, then maybe they're lacking in faith or are doubting God. But this isn't so. Any question when asked toward gaining understanding is welcomed by God. 
Read any of the Gospels to see how many questions Jesus was asked. How did He consistently respond? With patience and gentleness. And how many times did David cry out to God with heart-rending questions? Go to God and ask Him, because He who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, says Romans. God knows how you're thinking and what you're thinking, and He knows why you're thinking. So why didn't he create you with this all-consuming need for love already met? Well, if all your needs were met, you wouldn't need him, would you? Imagine this for a moment. The God of all universes desires relationship with you. He created you to love and be loved, to know him and enjoy relationship with him. It is by his design that all your efforts to satisfy this need for love lead to the same dead end of failure. But dead ends are a very good place for checking the map. They are places where decisions must be made. Dead ends are where people choose to refuse, reject, or discount God, or choose to turn to him. Generating love apart from God. You've probably tried anything and everything over the course of your life to get love. Many try to satisfy the need by being promiscuous. Others by performing as perfectly as possible so that they can earn love and acceptance from others. Still others try to be everything to everyone, joining the right clubs, taking drugs to fit in, or behaving in just a certain way so as to be accepted. Every last one of us has tried using self-built techniques for generating love apart from God. And whether you're aware of it or not, you will do whatever is necessary to get love. Not because you're inherently bad or lustful. After all, love is a God-given need. But you see, all through the years of your walking here on planet Earth, you have tried to be in charge. From infancy, you began to develop ways of getting love, all because of this driving, intense hunger that God programmed into you. From the very start, you have been the one responsible for generating and maintaining your love supply. It has all been up to you. Some of you have been mega successful. You were the all-star in high school, summa cum laude in college, the one everyone wants at their party. Or you're standing on the top rung of your professional career and you have a house in town and one on the beach, a four-car garage, and a Monet over your mantelpiece. And this is your gauge of self-love. Now don't take us wrong. Having more than one home or excelling at your career is not wrong, but it's certainly an inferior and disappointing source of love, one that could run dry exactly one moment from now. Others of you can't identify with this super successful person at all. Your techniques for getting love haven't been nearly as productive. You might grade yourself moderately successful. And then there are those of you whose techniques have failed miserably. You have rarely, if ever it seems, been able to milk love from the world. As a result, you have come to feel and believe with great conviction that you are an unlovely person. Your self-esteem correlates directly with your degree of self-love. If you are acceptable to yourself, then your self-esteem is probably good. But regardless of how successful or unsuccessful your techniques have been, this fact remains. You have tried, along with everyone else, to get your need met for love in your own strength and resource. Remember now, your father designed you with this need and made it such that nothing, repeat, nothing outside of him can satisfy it fully. He wants to be the supplier. But for many of you, the dynamic of your depression is that you seek to stay in control, generating your own supply of love. But because you cannot manipulate all the players in your world so as to get love from them, your need for love only goes wanting. Your frustration and hostility levels climb higher, and your depression only gets deeper. The harder and more you try to find love apart from God, the more futile your efforts, the more deprived your need for love, and the more prone to depression you will become. Of Habit Patterns and Computer Programs each one of us has developed techniques over the years apart from God for getting love or techniques for coping with not getting love, and we have programmed these techniques into our computers. That's right, our computers. 
Now, before you decide that we're crazy or that you missed a page somewhere, let's go back to the model of man we wrote about earlier. We determined that your soul, or the real you, is made up of your mind, will, and emotions, your thinker, your feeler, and your chooser. The will and emotions are fairly straightforward and easy to define. But just what is the mind? So many believe it's basically the same thing as your brain. Not so. It's common to hear the brain referred to as a highly sophisticated computer. And this is no misconception. In some cases, the brains of the great thinkers, like Einstein, have been preserved in hopes that someday their extraordinary capacities can be better understood. Scientists want to know more about how their computers worked. Like your heart or your liver, your brain is a part of your body. It's flesh that can be extracted and stored in a jar, like a heart. Your mind, though, is not flesh. It is something intangible. Think back to our definition. The soul is made up of the mind, will, and emotions. Your brain, being a body part, is simply your mind's PC. Your mind uses your brain to process and store information. And it is your mind which directs will to choose what to do with that information. Our second son, dear sweet Mason, was born with a very defective brain. His computer didn't work well. He was profoundly mentally retarded. And when he died in 1972 at the age of 12, the real Mason, complete with spirit and soul and a sound mind, exited and went home to be with God. His body will be redeemed by God one day, but right now it's in the ground in Poto, Oklahoma. So when you die, your mind goes where your soul goes, but your brain goes where your body goes. Your brain is the organ in your body which stores data. It's programmed with information. For example, you probably learned early on in life that crying got your mother's undivided attention. You programmed this bit of information into your brain, and from then on, if and when you wanted something from your mother, you cried. In this same way, you learned that whatever worked and what didn't work with dad, your peers, your siblings, authority figures, members of the opposite sex, and so on throughout your years of development were all an attempt to gather love for yourself. Over time, you found that some ways worked and others didn't, and that some worked much better than others. After years of programming, after years and years of use and practice, you can begin to see how these self-generated techniques, like a heavily traveled road, become deeply ingrained in your brain as patterns of thought and behavior, habit patterns of thought and behavior. Or, to return to our analogy, this is how your computer became programmed. The flesh defined. These habit patterns of thought and behavior fall under the classification called flesh in the Bible. You must understand that we're not talking about your body here, but patterns of thought and behavior. The term flesh in the Bible certainly refers to the body in many instances, but we wish to focus upon one of its other meanings in Scripture. Flesh. Patterns of thought and behavior that you use in an attempt to get your needs met your way, using your strength and your resources apart from Christ. In his letter to the Philippians, the Apostle Paul wrote this about his own flesh. For we put no confidence in the flesh, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. Paul is talking here about his patterns of thought and behavior toward gaining acceptance from himself, others, and God. He's telling the Philippians about his flesh and its effectiveness at satisfying his needs for acceptance and love. His flesh was the mega successful type we talked about earlier. You didn't get any better flesh than Paul at being a Pharisee and earning the acceptance of the peer group and, they believed, the love and acceptance of God. Paul's flesh was as good as flesh gets. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. But of course no one, not even Paul, can earn God's love through his or her flesh. That's just not the way it works. And Paul certainly knew this. In order that I may be found in him, 
not having a righteousness of my own, but that which is through faith in Christ Jesus, he writes later. Annabelle's Flesh Like a thumbprint, every person's flesh patterns are distinctly their own. Paul had his, we have ours, and you have yours. These fleshly patterns form the backbone of every thought and behavior, and so many of them can develop into the same oak tree of depression. The person who has programmed their computer with inferiority will never measure up in her mind to a person of worth. To her way of thinking, she's never as good as the other person. Her patterns for self-deprecation and misdirected attempts at getting love often spiral into depression. The control freak, who can't keep it together but can't let go, trying to be perfect, can drown in depression. The person racked with shame and guilt will never find the grace, outside of God's grace, to enjoy peace and forgiveness, and she can wither into depression. Here's the story of Annabelle's flesh. I was in and out of depression for many years, even as a dedicated Christian. The root of my depression was my flesh pattern for performance-based acceptance and its partner, performance-based self-acceptance. This wasn't very difficult to discover. You see, this was my way for trying to get my need for love met apart from God. I certainly loved Christ and understood that without Him I could do nothing. What I didn't understand was that he didn't just come into me to save me, but to give me that abundant life that he wrote about earlier. I thought I had to earn God's acceptance and love. I was walking in deception. Many of you reading this book are members of the POA, Performers of America, and you're walking in the same deception. In order to be loved, I have to perform, and perform well. You know, this permeates our culture. I was controlled by perfectionism, extremely sensitive to any kind of criticism. Whether it was constructive or not didn't matter. I was plagued by thoughts of inferiority and constant introspection, always evaluating my performance for its effectiveness at getting love from others. To my mind, I had to perform in order to please not only myself and others, but God. And when all was said and done, if I performed well, I rewarded myself with self-acceptance. If I didn't, self-rejection, and I was a hard taskmaster. Up until I was married, I was able to successfully gain love from others through my performance. I avoided very close relationships, though, because I felt that if you really got to know me, you might not like me, and that wouldn't do, because that would wreck my whole operation. But God wanted a close personal relationship with me. He wanted me to know His unconditional love. As is the case with many Christians, though, I had to reach the end of my own resources before I understood this. My rocky marriage relationship proved to be the undoing of my way to get love. Throughout the early years of our marriage, I felt I was unable to satisfy my need for love because I felt Bill would not affirm it. I didn't feel that I could please him and consequently could not please myself. He had his own flesh patterns, of course, and they were in full gear. He had married a very strong, capable, enthusiastic performer, and this threatened him. His self-survival flesh patterns involved tearing others down, particularly strong women, in order to maintain his own facade of self-love. But praise is the lifeblood of a performer, and when Bill didn't get it to me, I began to develop some new patterns and program them into my computer. Mood swings, tears, pouting, self-hatred, suicidal tendencies, and ultimately, depression. This went on for years. I descended deep into depression. And as is often the case with acute depression, I got to where I couldn't remember anything nice that happened yesterday or any of the days before. All I could recall were the bad things that happened. The worst part was that I couldn't imagine anything good happening tomorrow. Why should I? After all, to my mind, Bill didn't love me. I didn't love me, and to top it all off, God didn't love me either, because, like everyone else in my view, I had to perform well enough to please Him, and I wasn't. To my mind, I was a complete failure. I felt so down on myself that I could hardly stand it. My once hyper-productivity was reduced to nothing, and I blamed myself. Eventually, the simplest everyday chores became major undertakings. I would have a load of laundry to fold, 
And as this depression would roll over me, it was as though my hands were moving in slow motion. What's wrong with me? Not only could I not do things well anymore, I could hardly do things at all. I had definitely reached my rope's end, and I saw absolutely no hope on any of my horizons.